My name is Tina and we'd like to welcome you to Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. Uh, we are the country's largest no-kill sanctuary and on any given day we're caring for over 1,500 animals, uh, mostly cats and dogs. We have over 650 of each of them, but we also have horses, sheep, goats, uh, pot belly pigs, rabbits and birds. Uh, our main horse department is located over here against the Red Cliffs. Um, at this time, we have between 25 and 30 horses here at Best Friends. Most all of them are older horses or have uh, some type of a medical condition that prevents them from being ridden. Um, next, to, The next building you see is the Best Friends membership offices. At this time, we have over 250,000 members. So it is a full-time job for a lot of our staff and our folks uh, doing all they can to keep track of our members and doing all that we can to have them feeling supported. Also. Um, Next to that building is the Best Friends Network. The network is our animal assistance line. They take in all kinds of phone calls and emails every day on a daily basis from all over the country. Um, on a normal day, they probably receive between 100 to 150 phone calls and emails. Uh, since Hurricane Katrina hit, we haven't had many normal days. Most of uh, their workload has been increased by about five-fold and a lot of the folks that normally work here at the sanctuary are down in the south right now helping to uh, care for those animals at our shelters down there. We've uh, had two shelters. The first one was um, in Tylertown, Mississippi and uh, that was a temporary shelter and now they've moved most of their operations over into the celebration station in, um, We have been real actively involved with those efforts in the South. Uh, Best Friends members along with other folks that called the sanctuary and wanting to make some type of a monetary donation where we managed to raise close to $4 million. And most all of that money will be used for, it's in a separate account, and that will be used for caring for the animals. Uh, also uh, doing what we can to reunite all those animals with their previous owners and then any monies remaining will be used to rebuild the shelters and the um, uh, rescue groups that were up and running in that area prior to Hurricane Katrina hitting. So we feel very good about the, our efforts there and have worked very hard to do what we can to help uh, down there with those hurricane relief efforts. I'm Carol Bauman, and I work here at the Welcome Center, and this is Cole. My husband and I adopted Cole from the sanctuary, and when we got to look at his papers, it turns out that he was left here tied to a tree with a bowl of food and a bowl of water. Um, he already had this scar in his side. Um, it had never been treated or stitched by a veterinarian, so um, I theorized that somebody who loved Cole very much left him here tied to the tree. Uh, it was probably an abusive um, home, and whoever left him here left him here to save his life. And uh, so I'm glad it happened that way. And Cole has really enriched our life, and uh, I think he's pretty happy where he's at. <laughs> He's also a Welcome Center greeter now, so he has a job. Um, in addition, addition to herding my horses at mealtime, <laughs> um, he comes to the Welcome Center and leans on people's legs and uh, rolls over on his back for belly rubs. <laughs> He's a poor dog. And, uh, yeah, there he goes for a belly rub. <laughs> That, that's Cole waiting for a belly rub. Um, he also was adopted by a family with children at, before we adopted him, and that didn't work out. Um, he was a little nervous around high-energy kids, so he's in a home with no kids, and he's also an only child, which makes him very happy.
This is Dizzy. She is the guest around 12 years old. She's been at the sanctuary here since June. Um, she came from the Los Angeles City Shelter as a stray, and they were going to euthanize her after having her for 12 days. A California rescue group um, saved her, and unfortunately they couldn't find her a home. And they asked best friends to take her, so best friends took her. And I saw her, she was on our special needs website, her cute face. And um, as I said, because of her age, she wasn't highly adoptable and she has several medical problems. She's on two heart medications and she's got skin issues and she's got panis, so her vision is pretty poor. So she gets three different eye medicines every day. So. What's she like? She's as sweet as can be. She, her first love is food. Second love is other dogs. Doesn't, she doesn't care what size. She loves other dogs. And her third love, I guess, is people down the line. And I just officially adopted her last week. Her, it, she comes to the Welcome Center, comes to work with me every day. And she loves meeting everybody and all the dogs that come in to visit. And, and she, I have another dog at home who's 12 and uh, they get along well so he's and he's a large dog so he kind of chases her around she chases him around so she's doing good so i'm wondering if they is uh, now i'm going to tell you a little bit about the sanctuary here in Kanab. it's uh, our only sanctuary as i mentioned we are the country's largest no-kill sanctuary um, it was started by a group of folks just like you and i that were big animal lovers back in the late 1970s. Uh, this group were uh, folks from many different backgrounds and the thing that was the common bond was that they were all very, very much animal lovers and they were concerned about the number of animals that were being euthanized or put to sleep in their local shelter and they wanted to make a change so they pulled those animals out that were scheduled to be put to sleep and uh, did their best to find homes for those animals with folks that were looking to adopt a pet or, or have an animal in their home and and to their surprise they had great success with that had a uh, did very well um, at the time they were living on a small piece of property near Prescott Arizona but back then just as today there were always a few animals that for whatever reason they had difficulty finding a home for and so it didn't take very long until they definitely needed more space so uh, <clears throat> Uh, one of this group of friends was passing through our area here in Kanab on his way to Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, he came through here and he was just awestruck by the land. He was so, he just thought the land was very spectacular and he was told that the weather here was moderate most of the year. And uh, the people were friendly and so he asked about whether there were any large pieces of property for sale and he was told there was a large working cattle ranch here in Kanab Canyon that had just come up on the market. So he came out and had a look and had a real strong feeling that this is the land that they had been looking for to start that animal sanctuary they had talked about. So he told his friends and they came out and had a look at it and they all agreed that this would be a, a beautiful spot to, to start that. <clears throat> I'm Cyrus Mejia. I'm the resident artist here at Best Friends, but I wasn't always that. Uh, at the very beginning, I was one of a group of people who helped to start Best Friends Animal Society, and that was back in 1984. And we've been here for about 21 years at this point. Uh, but back in the early days, it was, a, it was a dream that some of us had, and it was based on the notion that the idea of putting animals down, killing animals in shelters just because there was no room for them and there were too many, that that idea was unacceptable. Um, we were uh, part of a, a growing, I guess, group of people at the time who felt that, but we thought we were the only ones who felt that. And so our dream was to create a sanctuary for some of the animals that were unadoptable, difficult to place, uh, some of the ones that nobody wanted, and we would uh, give them a sanctuary place where they could live out their days. We always wanted to do that. Um, 
at one point in the early 70s, we had uh, placed a small sanctuary in Arizona where some of us did take care of some animals like that, but it wasn't very big. And so we always dreamt that we would be able to find a, a bigger and a better place to do that. And that's uh, what happened here at Best Friends. And it sounds like, as I've been exposed, learning about this today, that the Best Friends Animal Sanctuary is way more than just this sanctuary. It sounds like a coordinated nationwide effort to, of uh, rescuing animals. Well, Best Friends started out as the dream of having a sanctuary. Um, and we take care of, uh, on any given day, about 1,500 unwanted, unadoptable, difficult to place dogs and cats and horses and birds and bunny rabbits here. Uh, but over the years, it has, our mission has expanded. And particularly in, during this last year, our mission expanded because of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, that came out of left field for all of us, especially you guys down in Houston were affected by it as well, because a lot, so many people came and, and relocated in your city. I'm sure it's completely uh, different now than it was as well. But our uh, chief operations officer, Paul Berry, is from New Orleans and uh, went down there to see uh, how he could uh, assess the situation. And that was before anybody knew that the city was going to be flooded. So as a result of that, we were on the ground, in place, ready to start rescuing animals. And we were one of the three major organizations that were in the area, uh, taking animals out of the water and out of the city and reuniting them with their people, if that was possible, or finding them new homes. And that created a whole new uh, personality, a new profile for Best Friends Animal Society and launched us into an area that we had never been involved before. Tell us, so can you list some of the programs of the Best Friends Animal Society? Well, Best Friends' mission is to help motivate, inspire people to a, a kinder world towards animals. And we believe that kindness towards animals builds a better world for all of us. And we believe that um, throughout the country there are many different people that feel this way. There are uh, individuals and groups and uh, small rescue organizations. All of us are part of what might even be called a kindness revolution. Uh, things are changing. Uh, people want more uh, purpose in their lives. They want more depth, the feeling of something that they're doing is, is important. And we see that all the time when people come here to visit. But kindness to animals is really the way that we see that we can change the world and make it a better place for all of us. Can you talk about how relations between humans and companion animals teaches humans love? I think all we have to do to see um, an example of unconditional love is look in the eyes of a dog or a cat, especially a dog. Cats are a little more aloof sometimes, but um, dogs represent that, and they, uh, their relationship with us is not based on whether they've had a good day or a bad day, or whether they're uh, hungry or feeling you know, lonely or any of those kinds of things. Their relationship is based on uh, unconditional love, and I think we can learn from that. I personally am a vegan, and that means I don't eat or wear any animal products. Um, I came to that over many years of working with animals and um, being vegetarian, but a few years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I made that other step towards being a vegan. And quite honestly, I, you know, I, I am aware of what goes on with animals and factory farms and all of that, but a lot of that came later. My first reason unusual as this may sound, my first reason for wanting to be a vegan was I like to spend a lot of time out in the wilderness around here looking at the, uh, hiking around in the canyons and seeing the wild animals and things like that. And I thought one day, well, if I was a vegan and they knew that I wasn't going to eat them, they'd probably come closer and I might feel more of a contact with them. So I did it. That was my reason for doing it. But obviously, since then, I've discovered much more about factory farming and the way that animals are treated, uh, and the whole notion of we raise so many animals 
uh, simply for food. And I find that something that I don't want to participate in. Your vegan cafeteria and... Uh, yeah, we serve at our, up at the village for our uh, volunteers as well as for the employees and the staff. Every day at noon we serve a vegetarian vegan meal. They're wonderful meals and uh, has a big beautiful balcony that looks clear out over the canyon and it's a wonderful place to come and have lunch. Christmas parties. Our, our Christmas, all our Christmas parties and anything, anytime that Best Friends provides food for, for, food for its employees, it's always vegetarian. So uh, that's just one of our uh, things that we lean towards here at, at the sanctuary. What's this uh, space on the left here? This is one of our horse pastures. Um, a lot of folks feel like if you can't ride a horse that it doesn't have any value or worth and Best Friends doesn't feel that way. They're wonderful animals even if you can't ride them. You can go out and walk them around and uh, groom them, check their hooves, and they have proven that spending time with horses is very therapeutic. Um, horses are very much familial type animals and they generally do better in groups of two or more. If you have one horse at home, would like to have you consider adopting one of our pasture pals. All our horses are supplementally fed twice a day and they're also rotated from pasture to pasture based on the condition of our grasses. If you look across the canyon there, you'll see another one of our horse pastures on that side of the canyon. This is a great view here down through the canyon. You'll see there's a small stream or creek there at the bottom. And uh, it's uh, called Kanab Creek. It's not very big, but it does run all the way to the mighty Colorado River. One of the things we have in an abundance of here at the sanctuary are wild turkeys, and you can see them up here ahead of us. <coughs> Those wild turkeys uh, go up on top where they into our animal areas where they'll scratch and dig and peck in the, in the daytime, and in the evenings they'll roost in these tall cottonwood trees here, here on, the, on the right. And they do that for their safety and protection from predators such as uh, bobcat, mountain lion, um, Coyotes, gray fox. They're just wild turkeys. They're not um, turkeys that we feed or anything. They just naturally live here and they come and go freely from the sanctuary. They are protected here at the sanctuary because we don't allow any honey. Um, but they've decided the sanctuary is a pretty good place to live. This barn here on the, there's a turkey trying to see him flying, making his way up top. They're big birds, so when they fly, they look kind of silly. Uh, this barn is what we call the Disney barn. Uh, Walt Disney filmed a movie here in the canyon long ago uh, that starred James Garner and Jodie Foster when she was a young girl. And um, the name of the movie was One Little Indian. It was here when we purchased the land. And it's a wonderful home to our horses. They don't know that that barn is just a movie prop, and we don't tell them, so they're, they're all happy with their little place to live and it, it does make a wonderful barn for them. There's some more of our horses. Looks like these turkeys over here have got their tails all fanned out. Uh, up here on the left is what we call Angel's Landing. Angel's Landing is a large natural amphitheater. Uh, Best Friends is Kane County's largest employer with over 300 full-time employees. And so when we get together for an all-employee meeting, we need some place that has quite a bit of room and lots of space. And we'll use that, that area in the spring, summer, and fall of the year. We've gone in and planted grass and put in picnic tables and that type of thing. We also rent it out for family reunions and wedding receptions. It's a beautiful spot that looks clear out over the canyon here. This is where our cat area begins. Here on Julia Street. Uh, Julius was one of the cats that was here at Best Friends first off, yeah. 
Okay, this first building here on the right is what we call Kitty Motel. It's home of our FIV kitties. Uh, you'll notice that each of our cat areas have an indoor and an outdoor area. They're like the dogs. They can come in or out as they choose. Uh, the next building is the building we'll be going into, and it's called uh, Casa de Calmar. Uh, this is a donated building. And it's home to all our feline leukemia kitties. Okay, and we'll get out and go in here now. All right, so this is Casa de Calmar, and uh, let's see, let's come and go right down here into room one. We want to make sure we don't let any of these guys in or out. Joni, stick around. They'll want to chat with you. Okay. <laughs> hey, do you want to tell us about this? Your name and you tell us about this place. I'm Joni. Um, I work here at the Calmar building with all the leukemia cats. And this is a brand new building donated by Cal Ferguson in honor of his wife. She, they wanted to move here and live in Kanab, but unfortunately she was diagnosed with cancer. And so after she passed away, he decided to build this building in memory of her. And we ha now house all our leukemia cats here. There's about 45 cats in this building. Is there treatment for the kitties for leukemia? Um, there, we do give them a shot of immunoraglin once a month to boost their immune system. A lot of the cats carry the virus. It may not necessarily manifest itself right away. We have Cybella, who's right over here, and she's 20 years old. And she has leukemia. Little Siamese kitty there, Cybella. She's 20. Tell me about this. What's the outdoor? Tell me about the outdoor. Okay, area. our this, these are our outdoor areas. The cats are allowed to come in or out as they choose. We have the little kitty doors where they can come in or out of the building. Our outdoor areas are built real strong and sturdy, and secure. Um, the rafters have been left open intentionally versus having a crawl space that wasn't being used. A lot of the cats like to be up top. There's beds and food and litter boxes and that kind of thing up top, and so uh, a lot of them like the security of being up there. Uh, all of our litter boxes are uh, kept right here underneath the, this center table. It rolls out and uh, the kitties go in from the end and the caretakers just pull it out like this when they're uh, cleaning. And then when they're through, they just push it back over. Generally, each area will be home to 20 to 25 kitties. Come on, say hi. She was very feral when she came in. She's now getting to the point where she'll kind of stay and look at us. So this is the bunny house. We have about 100 rabbits here. Uh, they're free to come in and out. They're free to dig. They can dig down as much as four feet below the surface before they hit a concrete slab. All of our bunnies have been spayed or neutered and they're all very much adoptable. As I mentioned, we do have a, a lot of different types of wildlife that naturally come and go from the sanctuary. We have mule deer, bobcat, mountain lion, coyotes, gray fox, lots of wild turkeys. Occasionally we'll see a skunk, a badger, maybe a porcupine. Uh, we also have chipmunks, squirrels, um, pack rats and mice and the reptiles, uh, lizards, snakes, horny toads. We have all kinds of snakes, including rattlesnakes. If we uh, come across a rattlesnake in our public or animal areas, we don't kill it. We get on our radio and we call our maintenance guys and they'll come with a box and a snake stick and they'll take it out and relocate it out away from people. 
we have found that those snakes are generally as afraid of us as we are of them and they're just trying to to go about their business so uh, best friends doesn't believe that wildlife make good pets uh, we believe wildlife uh, should remain wild in their natural environment where they're happiest and healthiest and that's always our first priority to rehabilitate those animals and release them back into their natural environment where they're happiest and healthiest and uh, so we do all we can to limit any kind of imprinting and that kind of thing on those animals so that we are able to release them back. What is this department we're about? This is Feathered Friends. Uh, this is where our wildlife is all handled. In order for us to be able to work with any of the wildlife, we're required to have federally licensed wildlife rehabbers. They work out of this department. Also, this department handles all the exotic birds, domesticated exotic birds such as parrots, parakeets, cockatoos, cockatiels. And uh, they do their own um, uh, tour out of their department in the afternoons and you're welcome to go up and, and catch that tour at one. We can make arrangements for you for that at the Welcome Center. Best Friends has 3,000 acres here in the canyon. In addition to the 3,000 acres we own, we lease an additional 30,000 acres from the Bureau of Land Management. That provides a real nice cushion for a lot of the local wildlife that freely comes and goes from the sanctuary. We are on a main migratory route for the eagles, so in the wintertime we'll get to see them pair up and raise their young once in a while, and that's always a special treat when you get to see them do that. There's a couple of trees over on Cedar Mountain that's not far from here that uh, the eagles are in, and they come back every year, and so that's great. Uh, here to our right is part of the brand new national monument called the Grand Staircase Escalani Monument. Uh, we're sitting right now on the first st uh, stair step called the Kayabab Plateau, those white cliffs there in the distance would be the second stair step and then the pink cliffs of Bryce Canyon would be the third stair step. It's a large, a series of large plateaus that make up that grand staircase. Uh, most of the folks who live here at the sanctuary uh, have come from all over the country to live and work here. I'm one of the few locals uh, from the area. My family, uh, both my mom and dad's families helped settle Kanab and Fredonia just across the Arizona border. And as someone who is local to the area, um, I feel very fortunate to live here and raise my family here. I think we live in some of the prettiest country in the world. Folks come from all over the world just to get a glimpse of it. And I hope I always have a deep appreciation for it. The trees in this part of the sanctuary are called juniper trees. They're covered with little light blue berries. As the weather gets cold, those berries will turn kind of a purple shade and fall to the ground. We also have here on the sanctuary uh, pinion pine. If you've ever tasted pine nuts, it's the little pine tree that grows the pine nuts. And uh, don't they make gin out of juniper? I think so. I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Medicinal uses. Uh, we're heading down first into our dog areas. It's a pretty still morning to come and see the sanctuary. Just a little skiff of snow on the ground, and uh, this is our, as far as I know, this is our winter's first snow, and uh, not much to it, and most of the time uh, the snow melts off pretty quickly. We're warm enough that the, the snow doesn't last for very long. Uh, yeah, that, if something were to come in that's an exotic animal, that's exactly what we do. We take it on a temporary basis until we can make other arrangements uh, for a sanctuary that's more set up for handling the exotic animals. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure of that. I know we've had sugar gliders, which were pretty exotic. They were uh, a little fad that went through the pet stores a couple of years ago. and and it was kind of tough. Um, they have very specialized diets and they're nocturnal animals. And um, so I know, that's one that I know of that we ended up transferring to another sanctuary somewhere else, I think. Uh, this is what we call our uh, dog town. This is our dog headquarters and where our clinic is located. Uh, we have a fully functioning veterinary hospital here. We have usually two to three vets who work full time for best friends. Um, we have a spay and neuter program that's open to the public every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning where we'll spay or neuter any animal. Uh, 
Uh, this facility here to the left is called Tara's Run. Uh, Tara's Run is an agility course. A lot of the dogs who come here to Best Friends have been out living on the streets for a while and they may not be familiar or very comfortable with indoor things such as staircases, doorways, the feel of different types of surfaces such as tile, hardwood floor, carpeting on their feet. And Tara's Run provides a place where our trainers can take those dogs over and spend a little time working with them and helping them to become a little more comfortable with those indoor things. And uh, that's still our number one goal today at Best Friends is to uh, do all we can to help find homes for unwanted animals. And so uh, we do all we can to make that happen. Yeah, we're going to get out in Dogtown here up at Dogtown Heights. Uh -huh. We have two parts. Uh, Dogtown is the old original part of, do of our dog areas, and then we also have a part, a newer part called Dogtown Heights. I know. Uh, best friends felt it was very important that anyone coming to the sanctuary would be able to make a good assessment of the dog they were approaching. And so we came up with a color-coded collar system. We have four different colored collars. The first one is red. It means stop, do not approach that dog. It has aggression issues either towards people or towards other animals. It's to be approached and handled and uh, cared for by best friend staff or employees only. Next would be green. A green collar means that dog has passed the test. It's friendly to volunteers and visitors alike. A uh, purple collar means uh, that dog uh, did well with adults but didn't get along with kids. That's the kind of dog that would not be adopted into a home with children. And lastly would be yellow. A yellow collar means that that dog doesn't go out for walks. It has some type of a medical condition. <clears throat> We're headed up now into Dogtown Heights. Uh, we like to refer to this part of the sanctuary as our gated community. It's home of a lot of our older dogs. Um, this part of the sanctuary was made possible due to a very generous donation from a couple in California by the name of Homer and Dolores Harris. Uh, they had been longtime supporters of Best Friends and they felt like our older dogs needed something a little more special and a little more room. And so they came to us and said they were willing to make a, a very large contribution in the amount of $250,000 on the condition that Best Friends and its members would match that amount. And so we took the proposition back to our members. We were able to come up with a matching amount and uh, all of the facilities through this part of the sanctuary were made possible with that donation. Uh, this next uh, building here on the right is our fitness center. Uh, the fitness center is the facility that our groomers work out of and it's also where we can do the hydrotherapy for our older dogs. A lot of the uh, older dogs have joint issues with their hips or um, dysplasia, those kind of things. And so we can bring those dogs up here to our fitness center and we put them in a tank. We then fill that tank up with warm water. The water creates a buoyancy to support the weight of the dog and then we can turn the treadmill on and that animal is able to exercise without any stress or strain on its joints. So it's a real valuable piece of equipment for, our, for some of these older guys. Uh, these guys here that we're, we're going to get out and go in right here to old friends and they can tell you um, it, some of the dogs are older and some just may have some some joint problems they don't have to be older to have those problems sometimes it's a breed thing we do have a uh, something we need to ask you when we go into our animal areas, we ask into our dog areas, we ask that you don't put your fingers inside the, the fence. They may mistake your fingers as a treat. Uh, also, uh, we respect this as their place to live and so we don't put our hands on their fence. Can we talk to you? Sure. Okay. T tell me your name and, and who you're working with. My name is Jill and I work in the web department at Best Friends and occasionally I work with some animals and I, this is Beulah's first day doing the CGC, the Canine Good Citizen course. Thank you. So we're hoping that over the next couple of weeks Beulah learns a lot of new tricks and will make her more adoptable. And also, we're also hoping that these classes, I'd like to take her for more walks and stuff, will help her get to her ideal weight of 80 pounds. Right now she's around 105, so. 
She came here at 140 pounds. She got down to around 100, and then the holiday weight creeped on. She gained she's 100 pounds. Now. She's 100 now? She's 100 pounds now. So. She's a very good girl, very smart. So we're going to see how her classes go. Ready, girl? I'm Joyce. I'm one of the caregivers here. Um, I work Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Love my dogs immensely. They're all my dogs. I just can't take them home with me. They live here. Um, it's a wonderful job. The best job I could ever have. And I have to go now. I'm sorry, but I have to tend to the other volunteer with his dog. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Dranichek. I'm a semi-retired California reject. I moved here from Carlsbad. Uh, I'd been coming up as a volunteer for a while, and uh, just one day it grabbed my heart. I've already adopted the, goal, or the German Shepherd that you see in the car. Uh, this is how I, I, I guess, get my, pay my worth on earth. Love cures everything, and we give these dogs as much love as we can. Thank you, sir. Okay? And here's your next one to love. Ah! Hey! <laughs> Pinepoli! Did you see we have your article on the board there? Both yeah, that's pictures. nice. Yeah. Cool? yeah, I brought it in. Your I can't believe how many people in town stopped me and said, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Small town. Small town. You're well known. Come on, Scooter. These are their walks, and we usually let them walk where they want to go. JJ's dog that was adopted from best friends and the reason he's howling is because his dad's out walking other dogs. <laughs> it may be some jealousy. Good boy, Bucky. Good boy. Okay, so here we're coming into what we call our dog octagons. Uh, the octagons are shaped in that uh, octagon shape, and it's a shape we found works real well for us. You'll notice that these two octagons here in Old Friends are uh, named after Homer and Dolores, the folks that made the large contribution for this part of the sanctuary. Um, all the rest of the uh, Octagons are uh, named after dogs that have lived here in the past here at Best Friends. each of those sites. Uh, they also have a fan and an evaporative cooler to keep them nice and cool in the summer and, in the, and the concrete floors have radiant heat and so that keeps them nice and warm in the winter. Um, <coughs> generally each dog run will go home to anywhere from three to five dogs. Uh, as you know dogs are pack animals and so anytime we introduce a new dog to a run it's uh, really important that that's a good assessment. And so we have folks that are specially trained, uh, and they'll spend the first couple of weeks with the dog getting to know it, its personality, its likes and dislikes, and activity levels. Then they'll decide where that dog would best fit in, and then when that dog is introduced into a run, it's introduced to each of the dogs individually before it's uh, brought into the pack as a whole. And then that dog is watched and monitored very carefully to make sure it's a good fit. Here is 
Jesse. serve two purposes for us. Uh, most of the time our dogs are kept in groups or in a pack setting. And so the sleepovers really provide a little bit of one-on-one -on -one attention. And uh, also because they live in group settings, uh, they, if they have an issue, we may not be particularly aware of that issue. But you put that dog in a one-on-one -on -one situation, a lot of times those issues will come to the surface. So it's a wonderful tool for us that tells, helps us know what areas we still need to work with that dog to get them ready for adoption. Notice that our area is well suited for these horse pastures. We have a lot of these little small box canyons and uh, that rock work makes a perfect natural barrier for our horses and then we come along and, and build a fence across the front of it and it, it does make beautiful pastures for our, for our horses. This time of year it doesn't look very bright and green but in the Spring and summer, it's beautiful. These pastures are just gorgeous. How many horses do you have? Uh, between 25 and 30, most of the time. Uh, most all of our horses are adoptable. Um, occasionally, we do get in a few younger horses. Uh, we do have trainers that work with those horses, and, and so we do all we can to help uh, those horses be adoptable and find them good homes. Uh, we get them from all over the country. Uh, sometimes our department, will, our horse department will go and pick them up and other times uh, folks will bring them here. All of the animals that are brought into the sanctuary are uh, brought in on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if you look up here, you'll see what we call turtle rock. It's a little uh, natural rock formation that looks like a turtle with a little beret on his head and a nice big smile on his face. Also down here we've got a little dirt road that comes down across the slot canyon and back up the other side. That's the road that our horse department takes getting over to those other pastures on the other side of the canyon. Do you have any 
wild horses or burros? Uh, we have had. We have um, at one time best friends had some of the horses that came up out of the Grand Canyon. Um, I think that's been quite a while ago, so I'm not sure whether those horses or, or those burros are, are still here. But um, we've we've heard that those uh, that uh, the Park Service maybe or BLM may be doing another um, evacuation of some of those burrows. So. Okay, we're coming up to a real special place here at Best Friends. This is our pet cemetery. It's called Angel's Rest. Uh, generally, our caretakers work in the same area day after day, and as you can imagine, they become very attached to the animals in their care. Angel's Rest provides a place where they're able to come and sit and spend some time and reflect back on those animals that they've loved and cared for. The front gate here was designed by Cyrus Mejia, who is one of the original founders. As you look around, you'll see that Angel's Rest is a beautiful spot. Um, there's a lot of animals that are laid to rest here, all the animals from the sanctuary. Uh, this part mostly is the uh, where the cats and dogs are at, and then uh, over there on the other end is what we call Angel's Nest, and that's where the birds and the rabbits are at. Our horses are down in one of the pastures in the canyon. And it's a wonderful place in the most of the time the uh, canyon here has a small breeze and these wind chimes make a beautiful music up through the canyon. And it's a, a fun place just to come and, and walk around and look. You can really feel a, a special spirit here at Angel's Rest, I think. You can tell the, that the animals here have been loved and, and that they're missed. And uh, We do have members who will make arrangements to have their animals laid to rest here as well. We have uh, gazebos and rock benches and that kind of thing, so we like to encourage folks to come and spend time here. Our members will a lot of times do that. We can walk over and see if Lenny is here, and he could probably tell you a little more about Angel's Rest as well. What's your name? Lenny. What do you do here? I take care of Angel's Rest, the tell pet cemetery. Tell me about that. Well... Fourteen years ago, the founders here decided to have a place for uh, the remains of those who passed on at Angels at, at the sanctuary. And we created a place called Angels Rest. And now we have about 3,500 placements up there. Every animal that passes here is buried in full body at Angels Rest. Sometimes members send uh, or bring their loved ones with them, and I place them. My job is to take care of the place. I prepare the sites place the animals, tuck them in, and keep the facility looking as nice as it can ever look. Are these birds? Um, no, they, these would be dogs or cats, I think. I heard him. You can see the little chickadees out here. That's not. He must have. Maybe that was him in that truck that just left. Usually they're in a the little white truck, but I don't see them out here this morning. You can see the little quail running over
or any of your companion animal spirit here? They're not. I've only been at Best Friends for about four years. I have two dogs at home and when the time comes, this is where I will have them placed for sure. I do have a lot of friends that have their animals uh, placed here at Best Friends. If you come back and spend more time at uh, Angel's Rest, also watch for the large birds. We live in an area where there are eagles, owls, hawks, crows, and ravens. And this particular part of the canyon is where they like to come and ride the wind. They come and float on the breeze. And about a week ago on one of my tours, my morning tours, um, we were coming down this little dirt road and right in the top of one of these juniper trees was a, a large bald eagle with his white head and white tail feathers. It was really spectacular and all the folks on the tour got to get a, a wonderful shot of that and that was really fun. The different layers of uh, uh, sandstone were made from at one time this canyon all being underwater and so the, the layers of sand eventually formed into into rock and, and that what that's part of what makes this the rock formations here through the canyon so so spectacular our area was once known as little hollywood because of all the old movies that were filmed here especially old westerns a lot of old western movies were, were made here in the canyon A couple of the popular films were McKenna's Gold starring Gregory Peck, also the outlaw Josie Whale starring Clint Eastwood. Uh, this particular part of the canyon right up through here is what we call Ambush Pass. It was used in many of those old western movies as the point where the, the bad guys would be on the run and the posse would be waiting to ambush them or, or maybe it was the other way around. But it's easy to picture the, the guy in the long slicker and a long rifle in his hand bailing off one of these rocks and jumping onto the passing stagecoach. And it was used that way in lots of old western movies. 